Good evening. Um, welcome to Peacock Alley, where we're broadcasting live um, the legislature today with your host, Dale Wetzel, and Gary Eminence filling in for Scott Hannon, who's back in Fargo tonight. So, Dale, what do you think? Tonight's Wind Down Wednesday, so everybody looks like they're relaxing down below. What do you think? It looks to me, after you've drunk that glass of wine and about, I don't know, three or four others maybe i oh, think you're come on. i this think is you're one. i think you're uh <laughs> taking full advantage of half price <laughs> bottles of wine at the peacock alley in Bismarck, <laughs> north dakota on wednesday night yes it looks like you're well relaxed and you have a i mean i shouldn't be talking about this sort of thing on the radio but you have a very smashing looking pink shirt on with a collar and you have a glass of wine in front of you and i have uh you know the latest Lands End stylings <laughs> and, and a bottle of water You're with uh, living healthy. Yeah, yeah, looking great, living healthy. Yeah, I looking, like this looking slum. So great, yeah. Some guy um, here. So, uh, we, this morning or this today at the legislature, there were a, a number of things that were going on. Of course, as there is every day when you have a eighty day session every two years, you have to kind of cram a lot into every day, and so there's something every day, a lot of things every day that. Uh, that are that bear mentioning what i wanted to talk about was uh two things one there is a a bill for a 30 million dollar a grant fund for north dakota's public colleges and what they would do would be to use this to raise private support uh from donors for their foundations uh the the way it would work if they can if if the schools can raise two dollars or if the schools can raise two dollars of private funding the uh, this endowment fund, this uh, grant fund, will kick in one dollar. Uh, the no- University of North Dakota, North Dakota State University, can get up to ten million dollars uh, from this fund. Uh, the other nine schools in the North Dakota University system could get one million dollars each. Again, they have to raise two dollars in private funding to get one dollar uh, from this uh, fund. And it was explained by uh, foundation officials and university uh, folks at the hearing that uh, when you have a situation where you can get some kind of uh, taxpayer supplement to a private giving, that the private givers are more likely to open up their wallets, especially when you have uh, a situation where you're trying to get money from someone that may not be a natural donor to your college uh, corporation or some business with that uh, might that may be interested in one of the programs but maybe is not that keen to donate unless they see some kind of state support as well. The other issue I wanted to mention has to do with the smoking law, the I should say the anti-smoking law that uh, the North Dakota uh, voters uh, approved last November. It was an initiated measure. It banned indoor smoking in the workplace. Uh, no more smoking in bars, no more smoking in motel rooms, any public workplace, uh, no more smoking in North Dakota. And there's a couple of instances where legislators have, have brought forward proposals to change the initiative. They both probably will require a two-thirds vote to be approved because once an initiated measure is passed, you need a two-thirds vote within seven years to change it. Uh, in the legislature, uh, the the theory being that the legislature shouldn't just be able to run roughshod over an initiated measure that is approved by the voters directly. What these have to do with, one of them would compensate businesses for their expenses in uh, complying with this new initiative. The other would... uh, Impose, well, it would bring about a definition of entrance uh, as it applies to the law because uh, by the, the law says that you have to, that you can't smoke within 20 feet of a building entrance. And so the question becomes, what is an entrance? Well, it's being interpreted as being not only the front door to the business, but also the garage door that's used to load in goods in the back or a loading dock bay. Um, and should you have to put a placard next to a opening in a building that isn't normally used as a public entrance that says no smoking here uh, you know you have to be at least 20 feet away outside the building to smoke i mean is it really is that really necessary uh, and that is uh that's what the debate is about uh and there's also a, a provision in that same bill that says that you have to label or you have to 
placard or, or put a sticker on a vehicle that it's used in a workplace uh, because a vehicle that's used as part of the business is considered a place of employment and therefore you can't smoke there. And should you have to put stickers in your plumber's truck, your, uh, your state fleet vehicles, there's more than 3,600 of those, uh, any, uh, the vehicle that you're driving yourself, your own vehicle when you're being paid mileage to do so. Uh, so those are issues that the legislature is trying to work through, and uh, that those were the things that were going on today, uh, Dale, and that's. Dale, who's the enforcement agency when it comes to that? Is it the? Who, who it's the lo- it's it's the local police. I mean, if you if you see someone, uh, if we saw someone outside the Peacock Alley smoking, you know, within five feet of the door instead of twenty feet, we'll just call the local constable and say, look, there's a guy uh, smoking uh, within less than 20 feet of, of that door, go and arrest him or, so, or ticket him. So if they arrest him, is there any burden back to the There's business owner? that if I, Let's say I own Peacock, which I don't, but the, hypothetically I did down here. Would they be? Would, would there be a fine back to the owner of the, of the local business at the present the way the not, present law is? Not on the first offense, but if, there's, if a business makes a habit out of allowing violations, uh, I don't know if it would apply to someone outside the business, but if if it was someone inside who was smoking and there was a complaint about that and then there were several of them, then that business could have uh, could be penalized. In fact, if you know the place that we're sitting, if there were people smoking here and it was a habitual thing and, and the owner was ignoring the law, the owner could have uh, his uh, tobacco license revoked, his license to sell uh, cigarettes, and also his liquor license mm. revoked, uh, his license to sell booze, which of course is... Uh, quite a bit more valuable. Now, Dale, this hour is um, one of our sponsorships, University of Mary. So you have a special guest with us this evening, and um, you're going to have a, a good time talking to a number of great issues of what's going on out at the University of Mary. I've been out there occasionally for sporting events and attended some things at Gary Therrelson School Business out there. So this is going to be a good segment looking at one of our sponsors and our special guest this evening. And uh, it, the gentleman's name is Mr. Carl Sovak. He's an assistant professor at the Gary Theraldson School of Business at the University of Mary. Welcome, Professor. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I love the format. I, I said when I got here, this is really a cool concept. And, and I congratulate you on your thank new you. endeavors. And, and I think it's a great way to get the news out. We think it's a cool concept, too. The, the question becomes, is it going to be a profitable concept? <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's always the challenge with any new startup. But you know what? We got great talent. Carl, so having Dale heading up this whole news service and this, the newspaper stuff that he's doing as managing editor, um, we, we, they, as you know in anything in, in the school business, when it comes down to it, if you've got the right talent, you've got to put the right business plan in place, and then you've got to execute. So the execute is the challenge yet, though, but, but we've got the right team in place, at least with Dale heading it, so we're excited about that. That's half the battle. So, Professor Sovak, first of all, who is Gary Theraldson? Who is the school named for? You know, Gary Theraldson started out as a uh, single hotel proprietor and grew that into a uh, multi-million dollar empire. He's currently out in Las Vegas uh, developing new properties. And uh, he was one of our major benefactors and ended up getting our school named after him. And Gary has been out to the school a number of times, uh, always wanting to engage with the students. And uh, we, we got a hold of him when we started the Idea Center, and, and Gary was very instrumental in helping us with the uh, understanding startup businesses and things like that. So uh, he's just a, a very good role model for our students to, to follow. How did you come to approach him? I mean, was he, is he an alumnus or what? You know, I, I don't really know. I'm not, I'm not on that, that side of things. When the school was built, it was, uh, I know that they've been out looking for a number of donors, and, and Gary rose to the top. And my understanding was they played softball with, with one of the uh, fundraisers. So... Uh, it was just a natural uh, discussion that uh, there's some naming rights to the School of Business, and uh, we think you'd be a good fit for it. So he's in the hotel business. What hotel? Bi- what hotels does he own? Oh, a number of hotels. Uh, the uh, newest one that went up by the Home Depot building, the old Home Depot building up there. Uh, he has a number of interests in the, in the Fargo area as well. I understand that you spent uh, the last several months uh, teaching in Rome. Uh, amazing experience. And what uh, what were you teaching in Rome, and how were you able to make the students uh, pay attention to you when they're in Rome? Well, I taught a global leadership uh, class, uh, responsive leadership, 
on a global basis. And so we have 19 students that went with us over there. And it's a fantastic campus atmosphere. It's about a 30-minute bus ride, public transportation, into the center city of Rome. And so we're quite a ways away from uh, all the hustle and bustle, which makes it uh, conducive for us being able to be in a, a classroom situation, but also conducive for us to take and do some ventures, uh, daily ventures out into the city. And uh, so it was easy for us to, to encourage our students to get up in the morning and be able to take a, uh, a little bit of uh, intellectual walk and then go into the city and take a historical walk through a magnificent city in, in Rome. Well, did they ever take like a pub walk or a uh, restaurant walk? Or? There, there, were, were, there were many uh, walks that, that took us outside of things. And in fact, there were some that went up to Ireland. And, and okay. I know that they're known for their pub walks. That's, a, there, that's, so. a, that's a pretty stiff walk up there. <laughs> um, uh, how does one teach global leadership? What, is, what's, what are the elements of global leadership? Well, you know, we uh, parsed the word in, in its beginning right there. We wanted to talk about who was a global leader. And so we talk about what makes a global leader. And it really has to be somebody who was influential and impacted the world. And so that was one of the criteria. Uh, responsive, they had to be responsive to uh, the needs of not only their own community, but the world at large. And then leadership, the characteristics of leadership. And we talked about transformational leaders and just transactional leaders, but then also servant leaders. And that's one of our uh, founding uh, philosophies at the University of Mary. And so a number of the students chose individuals who were truly servant leaders, uh, John Paul II, uh, Mother Teresa. Those were the ones that rose to the top and were quickly snapped up. I imagine you use um, examples of global leaders. What are some examples of good global leaders that you use in your class the ones and, that and, we what, use, and what makes them global leaders well what makes them leaders is if they can provide a positive impact we we put some criteria to that what what is it that they would have to possess and one of it was an impact a positive impact on the world because you could certainly have a, a globally responsive leader like in hitler uh, but there was such a negative impact that that went along with that and so we talked about the opposites as well what made these leaders not be as responsive as, as the others. And so you have the Bill Gates and you have the Steve Jobs, people who have made profound impacts. Mark Zuckerberg, uh, people in films, uh, Steven Spielberg, uh, who, who bring a social message as well as an entertaining message. So there's a, a wide variety. We, we covered the arts, we covered history, we covered business, uh, we covered theology, and it was just a, a, an eclectic mix of individuals that the students covered. And really, they were the ones that had to come up with that, that global perspective on their own. When you speak about individuals like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, uh, do you talk about the negative aspects of their personality as well as the positive? I'm thinking about, you know, Steve, I, all three of these gentlemen, I believe it's fair to say, were difficult to work for. And... Uh, do you, is that something that you get into as well? That is something that I do, simply because I think if you take a look at Bill Gates, we talk about the historical aspects. I mean, he basically borrowed, if you will, and I'll be very kind here, he borrowed a number of ideas from people, shelved a lot of ideas from people, simply because he offered them a lot of money. Uh, he didn't come up with these original ideas on his own. Steve Jobs, very moody, uh, very uh, in control. And that was one of the things that we talked about as well is a servant leader is the one that develops others. And I don't think Steve Jobs was in the, the business of developing others. He, he had a business to run. Uh, he made it out there that he wanted to destroy Microsoft. He wanted to destroy any rival that came along. Mark Zuckerberg, the social network, we utilized that movie uh, to show them uh, the ruthlessness of uh, borrowing ideas and taking them as your own and, and the benefits that go along with that as well if, if you can make it work. So. Yeah, the line I remember for that, from that movie is when he's talking to his lady friend at the beginning, and she says, dating you is like dating a Stairmaster. Um, <laughs> uh, what, what are the elements of, ser you mentioned the term servant leadership. Can you explain to us uh, what that means? Plain and simple, it's, it's putting others before yourself, uh, making sure that you're developing those others around you, not being worried about, oh, is this person going to take my job? I can't tell them everything. You, you basically are there to serve. And uh, Monsignor Shea tells us it's, it's putting uh, the, the greatest example of a servant leader, which is Jesus, uh, first and foremost. And so we utilize that in our Benedictine values. 
we make it sure that, that people understand that uh, we are here to serve others. My role as a professor is to serve the students, making sure that they have the talents and the abilities that they need to be successful in the world. Are there people in the business world, uh, you mentioned servant leaders such as Mother Teresa. Are there people in the business world that you can hold out as examples of servant leaders? You know, we're finding that more and more when we take a look at... Uh, at certain businesses, I, I look at it on a local business. I think Niles Hushka with KLJ, a fantastic example of a servant leader. Uh, again, always about developing other people's. Janine Bisky was with Cross Country Courier. She learned from Dewey Teets, who was a, a huge mentor to mine. He was the founder of, of Cross Country Courier. These are people who devote themselves to making sure that other people are brought along. I always call it transcendency and that kind of, you know, growing up in the 60s, that had a little different con uh, connotation to it. But I, I think that it's like Oprah Winfrey says, is that when you're climbing that ladder to success, you need to have one hand on the rung reaching up and another one reaching down to bring others up with you because it gets lonely at the top. And I think that you've seen individuals who are very um, self-serving that they get to the top and they have a lot of flaws. Lance Armstrong, Bill Clinton. You can continually name these individuals who have reached a pinnacle, maybe at even an early age, and uh, they didn't bring those others along with them. They weren't about developing others. It was always a selfish uh, contact, and this is a very selfless concept. And I think that it's a tough one to grasp, uh, but we constantly take a look at those leaders that can be servant leaders. You mentioned a couple of businesses, KLJ and Cross Country Courier. Can you explain... What is KLJ and what is Cross Country Courier? Uh, Academist Lee and Jackson, I, I've been associated with, with them since I, I came here in 2005. And Niles and I, Niles is the CEO, and, and Niles Huska is, is, like I said, has been a mentor to me as well. Uh, very instrumental in helping us with the Idea Center and developing an incubator for startup companies, which Dewey Teach and I started. And uh, Academist Lee and Jackson, when you think about it, they're an engineering firm. But they possess so many other elements. They have government lobbyists. They have a uh, human resource department. They have a marketing department. So a lot of my business students, I think I still have four or five of my business students there that took internship positions and now develop those into full-time jobs. And so Academist Lee and Jackson has been very instrumental in, in, again, wanting to develop our students, and we continue to send them good quality students. I just got an email the other day. Uh, they're looking for another another person. So it's, it's a really a, a good concept with them. Cross Country Courier started with a single pickup truck. It was called Crosstown Delivery. Uh, Dewey Teets was, was delivering some some products. He started delivering flowers. He said he would deliver anything but babies. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and so when I came down here, uh, Dewey and I started talking, and he was affiliated with the Harold Schaefer Leadership Center. We were developing that a little bit more as in, in terms of uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, he and I sat down and literally over a napkin uh, came up with the concept for the Idea Center, which would be an incubator, and it still exists today. You mentioned that Niles Hushka was a mentor of yours. How did he mentor you? I'm just, I'm, what I'm getting at is what do mentors do? The, the biggest thing that Niles did for me was provide me with a sense of direction and focus. Uh, when I came down here, Sister Thomas, who to me is the epitome of servant leadership, she was the president at the university at the time, she said, Carl, you need to find a way to give back to the community. And I was quickly associated with Niles through Dewey. And Niles was very instrumental in, in not only introducing me to a number of people, so networking was, was a prime uh, concept behind what mentoring goes on, uh, but also letting me know and leading by example of this is the way that you do things. Uh, this is the way that you treat people. Uh, this, is, this is the way that you, you bring people into the fold and welcome them. And uh, again, just a wealth of knowledge. He, was, he would always send me, and he continues to send me, uh, things from Harvard and things from uh, different publications that he runs across. So again, it's just developing others the way that you feel that they should be, believing in others the way that they probably don't believe in themselves. To me, that's the definition of a good mentor. One of the things that, um, that I understand that you're involved in is something called the Student Equities Club. Uh, I am fascinated by that. Could you talk about what is the Student Equities Club and what does it do? Well, the Student Equity Club was established uh, about three years ago, and what it was was a, uh, an amount that the school decided that they would give to the students and it would be a student-managed fund. And, and this was actual money. This is not play money. money. It's not play money. Okay. It's actual money from the school. All right. And uh, Dr. Feng Zhao, uh, who is our finance instructor, is the overseer of that program. And I'm pleased to report that ever since they have started that program, they have exceeded the Standard & Poor uh, returns every quarter. 
So they beat the index funds, huh? They beat the index funds, and uh, he's very he's very happy about that. I think that he said that he sold Apple, if I remember the conversation. I just overheard it. They sold Apple at the right time. So uh, they, have, they have continually produced on a positive basis, and it shows the students, again, not play money, but real money, that, number one, the school trusts, trusts you. And, again, if you put your skills and your talents together, you can do great things. And so from an experiential standpoint, these students are understanding how to, how to manage a portfolio. How many students are involved in this program? You know, when we first started that program, I believe that there were, oh, probably, a, 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 I would say, a dozen. And it's probably down to six or seven. And I know that that's a, a growing program. And uh, uh, Dr. Zhao is, has, has worked on, on developing those numbers and telling students, you know, students are a different breed these days. They have so many things that they're being torn with. Um, that that when they do this, they do it with discerning uh, minds that, is this something I want to be a part of? And more and more of them are starting to see, hey, I got a chance here to, to be a part of something that's really huge within the university. Is it tough to get them involved in, in equities or interested in them because of the volatility of the market? I, I don't know if it's the volatility of the market or just the volatility of their time. Uh, time management is not their strength. and So we're working on those kind of things to make sure that they can balance their workload and their school load and get some good experience in some of those areas. Okay. Because I... How do they research their stocks, what they put into, what, what, what they put the money into? Uh, they, have, they have a number of, of uh, periodical resources that they use, Kiplinger, as well as a software program that Dr. Zhao has uh, available to them. We're speaking this evening with uh, Carl Sovak, an assistant professor at the Gary Theraldson School of Business at the University of Mary in Bismarck, North Dakota. We'll be coming back in the next half hour to speak to uh, Professor Sovak again about uh, some of the programs at the University of Mary and some of the ways that his students assist people in the community. We're broadcasting live from Peacock Alley. We're listen, listening to KFYR 550 AM, 1090 KTGO in Tioga, and 1100 The Flag in Fargo. So tonight we're broadcasting and talking with the legislature today, what's happening at the Capitol, and our host um, this evening for the is University of Mary. And so when we come back, Mark Dosh will be joining us. So stay tuned. Thanks for listening. We've been speaking to Professor Carl Sovak, uh, an assistant professor at the Gary Theraldson School of Business at the University of Mary, and Representative Mark Dosh, a Republican from Bismarck who has uh, been interested in higher education since he came into the legislature and has offered a number of bills uh, on that subject. The uh, establishment of gaming policy, the establishment of our oil and tax dollars, and how these monies are, are distributed and what the state's responsibility should be to help fund the social services on the Indian reservations, uh, you kind of have to look at the whole picture, and um, so that's why we want to we want to bring it back to legislature, so all sides can be looked at and and uh, you know keep that policy making responsibility back in the hands of the legislature. How about the uh, college scholarship legislation? What does that do? What that does it uh, it, it takes our um, the. Um, the academic scholarship that the state has in place right now and uh, currently in order to qualify for that uh, students have to uh, end their senior year with a GPA of 3.0 or higher and uh, an ACT store, uh, score of uh, 24 or higher. What my bill does is uh, it, it rather than require both it, it turns it to an or so if a student has a 3.0 or greater he qualifies, or an uh, ACT score of 24 uh, or greater, he also qualifies. So we're going to open it up to more North Dakota kids. Uh, you know, the problem is uh, the way it's structured currently, uh, you know, you could have a, a, a kid go all the way through high school with a 3.5 or 3.7 or even a 4.0 grade point average, and, and, you know, you take one ACT test and you get a 23 on it, and guess what? You're excluded from the, the state scholarship, and we just don't think that's right. You know, some people aren't uh, real good uh, testers out there, if you will, and uh, uh, so this will open it up, uh, take both types of students into account, and, you know, after all, gosh, if these students uh, work hard all during high school to uh, obtain a 3.0 or greater, uh, the state should be... Uh, willing and able. We have the resources now to, uh, uh, to certainly help them out and help offset that cost of uh, college education. Have you heard any complaints that this would be a diminution of standards in terms well, of getting a scholarship? 
uh, you know, that comment uh, uh, we did here, the question was asked actually in committee. And, you know, I look at it this way. Uh, I put a little bit more faith and trust in our teachers in K through 12. I mean, granted, there might be a, a couple bad ones out there that just kind of hand out grades, if you will, A's and B's. Uh, but in speaking with uh, counselors and teachers, uh, you know, what they say, you know, they've used this scholarship program as a tremendous uh, really help for them in the classroom saying hey you know you a student you're getting a 2.9 if you try a little bit harder uh, you know you can do this you can qualify for the scholarship and it's really it's been an incentive on behalf of the student it's been uh, incentive it's getting parents involved uh, finally uh, you know parents are taking note on what their kids are doing and what kind of grades are getting because you know there's a there's a six thousand dollar scholarship uh, uh, riding on this and the other thing that you have to remember is that you know even if they qualify for this scholarship uh, in their uh, in their you know uh, freshman year of college they still have to maintain uh, a GPA average in throughout college in order to get the scholarship I mean, it's awarded uh, each uh, semester and uh, so if they drop below it uh, they you know they could lose their scholarship so really this incentivizes them all four years during high school plus it offers an incentive during college that you guys got to keep your grades up in order to to keep uh, getting these scholarship dollars so i think it's a great program and the more we can open it up to to more kids in their state and you have to be a north dakota resident and graduate from north dakota high school in order to qualify so what better way to spend our our money our, our segment this, this evening is sponsored by the University of Mary. I understand you have a relationship with the University of Mary. Could you describe that? Well, you know, our relationship goes back uh, to the Univer University of Mary uh, uh, many, many years. Uh, uh, I'm in the hotel business, um, and uh, uh, many years ago when, when University of Mary was growing and, and expanding, uh, uh, we actually housed some of their students at the, uh, at the hotel. And uh, that's kind of when our, our relationship uh, really started with them. And, uh, you know, then we've, uh, we've been supporters ever since, been a member of their uh, President's Club uh, and, uh, you know, a, a supporter of, of various athletic programs that they have out there, uh, mini marauders, uh, uh, some soccer teams, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, uh, it, it's just been a, a good a good relationship. Were you were you jealous when the business school was named after another fellow in the hotel business? Well, you know, uh, uh, Gary Thorlson uh, has done uh, uh, is a, a remarkable businessman uh, in the state, and uh, you know, hats off to him. Uh, he started out in uh, I believe it was Valley City, North Dakota, and uh, he's done extremely well for himself. So, uh, you know, kudos kudos to him and. Uh, uh, we always uh, welcome the competition. Who knows, someday uh, uh, we may have something out there. The business school, uh, Professor Sovak, the business school at, at the University of Mary, what sort of, okay, I'm a, let's say I'm a student. I, I'm looking at your business school. What is it that the business school has to offer, has to offer me in terms of the programs? I think uh, two things that, that we really stress is the uh, experiential aspect. We make sure that we get people into the classrooms and we make sure we get our students out of the classrooms. Uh, through that experiential education, we require internships of all of our students, so we give them that practical real-world experience. Uh, Monsignor Shea says we have to stop talking about the real world and get them out into the real world, and so that's uh, one of the things that we focus on. From that experiential education, uh, we give them the opportunities through networking, uh, showcasing their skills to a, a wide variety of employers, uh, and, and mentors uh, that go along with that. We're currently working uh, with a program for our alum to come back and mentor our juniors and seniors uh, to just kind of tell them, hey, here's what you can expect when you graduate. So a, a wide variety of things, but again, experience education and, and opportunities that come from those, those experiences. What sort of internships uh, do your students uh, get as a matter of, of course? What are some of the common fields and companies that they work for? A wide variety. If it, We have four uh, majors and uh, really five, six majors probably, if you go through them all. Uh, of course, the accounting uh, aspects, they, they get it with the I. Baileys and uh, a, a number of accounting firms. 
uh, as well as working with uh, Cloverdale's, your your for-profit companies, and and even some nonprofits that that need some assistance. Uh, they also we have a sport and leisure management. So a lot of the park and recs, we have civic centers. We have individuals uh, going down to Rapid City and working within the civic center as an internship opportunities. Uh, Cloverdale, Cadmus, Lee, and Jackson, uh, wide variety. I I know that uh, Mark's son was was able to make sure, use of his internship at at the hotel. So it's it's a wide variety all over there. We have a financial and uh, banking services internship where they're able to work with a number of the local banks. And so, again, just a, a wide variety of, of different opportunities for the students in different areas. Is it tough to get students into financial and banking services? You know, we've worked on that. It has to go beyond just being a teller. Uh, we want to make sure that they have access to, to individuals. And so we have a number of banks. We have a number of financial planners that are willing to work with our students. Uh, the proprietary information, the private information, those are the kind of things that make it tough in that industry. Uh, but we f- have found ways to, to work with uh, the businesses to allow them to let our students get that practical experience. One of the things I was thinking of when I asked the question was, uh, I guess it's fair to say that um, unethical practices in the banking industry helped uh, crash the economy a few years back and to what extent do you think your students you know given that they're taught in a a, a religious moral atmosphere can try to counteract that i think the, the one of the biggest things that came out of that was greater transparency uh the banking industry is now uh, focusing more on on being more transparent and i think that that lends to more opportunities uh, what used to be a close-knit a uh, very closed society has now been opened up and made a little bit more transparent. And what is sport and leisure management? Uh, how, do, how does one get into that, and, and why would one go into that as a, a field? It is a huge growing field. Some, some call it sport and entertainment management. We call it sport and leisure management. Uh, you can do golf courses. You can do your parks and recs, uh, civic center, facilities maintenance. There's a ton of, of different things. Golf course. We have people that are managing golf courses that go through the sport and leisure management. Um, it's a growing field simply because of the number of baby boomers that are retiring and looking for those leisure activities. You need somebody to manage those things. And, and I always joke around that, you know, this underwater basket weaving will someday need a manager to, to manage that that course uh what you mentioned it made me think of a wall street journal article i read a couple of days ago it had it, uh, the headline was something like don't make fun of the gym majors because they've got lots of job opportunities and maybe uh, you don't uh, uh representative dosh uh do you think that the legis just to get on a bit of a different track do you think that the legislature the north dakota legislature uh takes into account private schools private colleges as much as it should in making higher education policy? Well, you know, Dale, I don't think they do, uh, quite honestly. Uh, uh, in fact, I've sponsored a few different pieces of legislation over the years. I, I have another one in, uh, in the hopper now that's uh, uh, going to probably be coming up in the next week or two. Uh, uh, it primarily deals with K-12 through uh, education, but allows uh, the... Uh, private schools to in essence contract with the uh, DPI to provide educational services uh, uh, so a school like for am- for instance uh, Shiloh or St. Mary's could contract with the DPI uh, to to educate the kids uh, and all they have to do is pay them 25% of the uh, cost of um, uh, what a cost if it, this child would be in the uh, public sector so it, it's a tremendous cost savings uh, to the state, and uh, I, I, you know, I think a lot of people overlook that when they talk about uh, private education. And um, you know, competition is always good out there. Uh, the private schools have have kind of proven that they can do a lot more with a lot less. And uh, you look at the funding uh, that we provided K through 12 and higher ed. Uh, you know, their budgets have doubled over the last uh, 10 years that I've been in there. And uh, you kind of have to scratch your head a little bit and say, you know, are the citizens uh, really, you know, getting the best bang for their buck? Uh, uh, is there anything wrong with uh, supporting non-public education out there if they're able to do just as good, if not in most cases, a little better job than the, the private sector? So, uh, you know, rather than having the taxpayer pay 100% of the cost of education, Gosh, if they can, you know, if if we can encourage others and and uh, to 
take this on for 25 percent of the cost why wouldn't we do it and uh, so it's kind of always been one of my goals and objectives in the legislature is to kind of do what i can to bring that to light uh professor uh, professor Sovak. We're, first of all, we're talking uh, this evening to Professor Carl Sovak. He's an assistant professor at the University of Mary in the Gary Therrelson School of Business. And the voice you just heard a moment ago was uh, Representative Mark Dosh. He's a Republican from Bismarck. And uh, he's. we're both here at a uh, speaking on the Legislature Today radio show uh, on a segment sponsored by the University of Mary. Uh, professor Sovak, I, something that uh, uh, Representative Dosh just mentioned made me think of this question. Do you see the public college uh, sector in North Dakota as, do you see it as competition? Do you see it as a partner? Do you, do you even think of it that much? You know, I, I would assume that there would be the four-year colleges, state colleges would be competition. But uh, as, as uh, Mark says, you know, you really put out a quality product. You really don't worry about that. And uh, I think that you've started to see a little bit of that more blurring. Uh, our partnerships with Arizona State, for example, our partnerships with BSC, uh, the two-year, what we, what we see as those uh, a two-plus-two programs where those students go through, get a quality education at the community college level or junior college level, and then move on to a, a higher education. We're, we're in partnership now with Dickinson State. Uh, so I think you're starting to see a number of different elements that come through where they are seeing the benefits of having a, a private education that goes with that, the holistic side of it, the Benedictine values, and, and finding that you can really nurture the whole person. And wherever you can get that education, the best way you can get that education, uh, I, I see it in the private school. Uh, I see it with the smaller class sizes, uh, greater relationships that we have, uh, quality of students that we have. Uh, and I taught it at both the state and the, and the private, and I, I love the private school setting. One of the... Uh Something I wanted to ask both of you about is what are the challenges that you see coming up for higher education, both private and public? I mean, there are, we mentioned competition a moment ago. There's competition from YouTube. I mean, there's lots of instructional videos on YouTube. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of the Khan Academy, the gentleman who does a, a number of classes on, on various uh, disciplines. You have online universities. Uh, uh, and in the meantime, you have all of the uh, attention being paid to increasing student debt and rising tuition and the consequences of that. What do you gentlemen both see as the challenges to higher education in the future, and, and how do we address them? Well, I, first of all, I, you know, the declining population of the number of students, we're starting to see that a little bit now at the elementary level where it's starting to increase, but the, the pool of which you can grab students is, is getting smaller and smaller. Uh, again, that should pick up again, but you're talking maybe K through 4, uh, where you won't see that now for probably another eight years. Uh, so that, that declining population, the pool that, that you have to draw from, a uh, majority of those students do choose state schools. Uh, private education is starting to do a better job of getting out there and marketing, again, the quality of the education that they'll get, the personal relationships that they'll get with, with people. And I think that that's probably the biggest challenge over the next uh, eight to ten years is to weather that, that little law in the, uh, the, the population pool. And uh, if you can get through that, then, then it's just finding that right delivery system that's best for uh, the, the changing uh, demographics of students. Well, uh, Dale, I agree on that. Um, you know, one of, I think, the biggest challenges in, in higher ed, and this is speaking now from the, from the public standpoint that we've been dealing with, you know, for years we were dealing with declining enrollment and, you know, uh, all the issues that come with that. And, and uh, you know, now we are starting to see an uptick, uh, at least in North Dakota here. But, uh, you know, the, the difference in things that are coming is, is the online services. And uh, so we... You know, as a legislator and, and looking at funding for higher ed, we want to be very careful what we do as far as expansion of, of you know, the brick and mortar type of things because, uh, you know, I think we are going to see the uh, change and, uh, you know, the collaboration uh, between colleges and universities such as uh, what Mar University of Mary's done has been great and I, I think maybe that's where we have to start focusing a little bit more of our, our effort. One of the things that was interesting to me about the governor's budget proposal was the amount of construction there was in there for higher education. And I wondered if that was congruent with any kind of trend toward more online delivery and, and 
methods of offering higher education that uh, don't need a expensive building. Well, and that's exactly right, Dale. Uh, you know, one of the things or a good portion of those funds, uh, 68 some million dollars of that is, is looking at for a new med school. And, um, you know, given our aging population and that sort of thing, our shortage of doctors, you know, that may not be too bad of a, an investment, a long-term investment for the state. Uh, but some of the other things in there, uh, uh, you know, I think we really, uh, we really do have to question and uh, be careful what we're doing. Professor Sovak, uh, one of the, we, we were talking earlier about servant leadership, and one of the things that I uh, was looking, looking at in terms of, you know, fulfilling that mission was uh, uh, what the business students do to help low-income people prepare their taxes. Could you uh, elaborate on that a bit? You know, our accounting instructors have always been uh, instrumental in making sure that the students get a practical experience, and tax time is the best time to take a look at, at crunching numbers, if you will. Uh, the Volunteers and Tax Assistance, which is the VITA program, has been around for a number of years. And uh, starting, I believe it is uh, Saturday, they'll already get going. The uh, fir I think it's the first Saturday in February, uh, 9 to 1130 uh, at the Butler Center. They make themselves available, no appointment necessary. It's all free. Uh, go in there, and you have the students help prepare your taxes. and. And uh, it's a, a great way for our students to, to involve themselves in that, and it's a great way for people to uh, at least double-check their work, if nothing else. Can you tell me who avails themselves of, themselves of that service? Uh, Dr. Rhoda Sotner is the uh, head of the, that program. Uh, she has been doing that now. I believe this is her fourth or fifth year doing that. And uh, so, yeah, you have an instructor there to oversee all of that, and then the accounting students that uh, take part in that. And, and it's, it's on a voluntary basis from them as well. Who are their clients? Who, who comes in for help? Generally, it is the lower income individuals and families uh, that would be, and, and I don't have the dollar amount off the top of my head of, of what that lower income would be. Do they have tough, are their returns tough to do, or is it pretty much here's your W 2 form and you know, subtract everything and, yeah, it's, <laughs> and send in the it's, check? It, it's, it's, it's more or less the, the, the easier forms to, to fill out. You basically have your W 2s, and you don't have a lot of deductions, you don't have a lot of expenses. And how, d how do the students benefit from this, do you think? You know, number one, they're, they're showcasing their talents to the people in the public. They're showing, hey, this is what we're doing, this is what we're learning, and we're able to, to uh, assist you in that. But I think the, the most valuable thing is, is, again, giving back. It's service to the community, and it's just another way of showing the Benedictine values to the community. I want to return to where we started from. You have spent the several months in Rome teaching global leadership. What was about Rome that impressed you. Talk about being in Rome, living in Rome, outside of Rome, being able to go into Rome. What do you think? I, you know, Rome is a, a wonderful touristy city. And uh, I, I, I've always said it, it was a, Rome was good, Europe was fantastic. And so uh, Rome is one of those cities that you just stand in awe. You really do. You, you go to the overlook and you see the magnificent city. Uh, but they have some wonderful people uh, a variety of, of churches that we went to. We went to almost every church that there was. And uh, so, so there's wonderful people in, in uh, Italy, uh, wonderful people in Europe, and it's just a fantastic experience. We've been speaking to Professor Carl Sovak, uh, an assistant professor at the Gary Theraldson School of Business at the University of Mary, and Representative Mark Dosh, a Republican from Bismarck, who has uh, been interested in higher education since he came into the legislature and has offered a number of bills uh, on that subject. Uh, thank you both gentlemen for coming to talk to us. Thank Thanks you for joining us tonight at yeah, Peacock Alley. Sir.